how how did you get to the point where you thought going back in there to save someone was was a good idea in the first place? Who is Aziz? Yeah, well, I don't know that it was a good idea, <laughs> uh, but uh, my wife certainly didn't think so at the time. But it, it was the right thing to do. Um, you know, Aziz had saved my life uh, multiple times, and I've seen him save the lives of many of our, of our special operations service members in his job. Uh, he was my interpreter uh, on eight deployments. So I had the same interpreter on eight deployments. My mm -hmm. job was a li little unique. As a Force Recon Marine, I went to a JSOC task force, a Joint Special Operations Command task force, and I was what's called an AFO, Advanced Force Operator. So I worked by myself in a singleton capacity to go out ahead of my unit and uh, build the infrastructure to put my assaulters on target to capture, kill bad guys. And so Aziz was my interpreter for that. He was also my teammate and more, more so became my friend. We spent weeks, months together in those mountains, uh, you know, doing our operations and when we go back on, on, on from operations, I wouldn't go to base and he'd go home. I'd go home with him and his wife Hatra would make meals for us and I was there when his oldest son Mashub was born in Mashuda and uh, I held them as babies. And so they were very mm. close to me. And again, he saved my life multiple times. And I say that, but he probably saved my life every day. Like, don't walk there, don't eat that, don't talk to that person. If you talk right now, they're gonna kill us. Uh, so he just, you know, he's the reason I'm I'm here today. He's the reason my wife has a husband that's home alive, and my kids have a father. And so to think of leaving him there in Afghanistan during the withdra this withdrawal was just something I couldn't do. And I, I had to, I didn't have the ability to change the president's position on the withdrawal uh, that I didn't mm -hmm. agree with and especially with how, uh, but I had the ability to help my friend. And, uh, and, I, and I just leaned on a, a bunch of other friends that I had that are special operators that didn't agree with that as well and just said, hey, let's, let's go get Aziz. And I had some amazing people step up to, to join forces with me to go and get Aziz. I think people can relate to your situation there. You have someone that you care about in this mm -hmm. dangerous area, They're, they need help. How you handled it is just not normal, <laughs> okay? Uh, the normal reaction is to, I mean, as a uh, podcaster in good standing, the normal reaction is to complain about it a lot and, and hope something changes. You decided to actually do something about this yeah. in, in, a, in, in, a, in an incredible way. I mean, you decided, you use your expertise and go there in the middle of all this chaos and try to rescue Aziz. I mean... You know, give me. You got to give us a little bit of the conversation of you yeah. talking to your wife about this. <laughs> well, I mean, my wife was. You know, I had this conversation with my wife, and I said, "Look, you know, she knows who Aziz is. I mean, mm -hmm. she she'd been around the whole time. So she's she's like, I can't stop you because I know that if you don't go, I would never be able to live with you. Yeah, and you wouldn't be able to live with yourself. So she supported that initial operation. Later on in the operations, as the and I'll talk about towards the end. The Tajikistan River operation, she was not on board with that. And it was, I remember the conversation going to the airport and she knew like me and Dennis Price were going to go into Tajikistan and swim in Afghanistan. She's like, I know you're going to go in. And I'm like, no, I'm not going to go in. And she's like, I know you will. <laughs> and, uh, and, and she was you know, upset, obviously. And, uh, and, I, and I just explained it like this. What, what if it was our daughter and this was us? What if, what if our daughter was going to be sexually enslaved the rest of her life? What if it was our sons that'd be forced into madrasas and trained to, to mm -hmm. and hate and become Taliban? We'd be praying that someone somewhere would come help us. And, uh, and, there, and there's someone somewhere right now praying that people that have the ability and means to go help will come for them. Mm -hmm. and, and right now, I, felt that burden, I had felt that burden on my heart. I had the ability to do it, and I couldn't not do it. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and, and I remember her not being happy with that answer, but about an hour later, after I was at the airport, she called me and she's like, I get it, and be safe. It's tough. I mean, it's, a, it's an impossible position for yeah. both of you guys to be in. So you decide to go in and, and get Aziz. Can you kind of, I know you, you, the book, you have all the details in there. Yeah. But, like, just tell us about, like, what is the, what is the state of play at this point? You're, you're going into a, a, a complete, you're, you're right at the beginning, right in the yeah. middle of all the crazy footage that's leaking. I mean, this, is, this does not look safe at all for anyone. Sure. You go in anyway. Well, I mean, uh, we, we start planning, and, and the, the 12 guys that put together incredible, you know, uh, Green Berets, Navy SEALs, Force Recon Marines, uh, CIAs, para, like paramilitary officers from Ground Branch, guys with incredible experience. So we have all this ability to go and help one family, uh, which was selfish of me, but I was pretty determined I wanted to go get Aziz. Mm. And then one of our teammates pointed out something uh, that changed everything. He said, there's these 3,500 orphans that are going to be left there. Let's go get them too. And so we kind of paused for a second and look around this room, look at the experience we have and their willingness. Let's get as many Americans, interpreters and their families, uh, women, children, Christians, every persecuted. Let's get as many people as we can. 
let's do it smartly, but let's get as many people as we can. And the group of people I had, the people I, that I selected to come were guys with that high level of special operations experience, but already had seen combat. We're not itching to go get in a fight with the Taliban. They're mature men who was mm. willing to just go help people that couldn't help themselves, not do anything cowboyish. And so we made the decision to do that. And if we get credit for anything, and I've, we've gotten a lot of credit, you know, Glenn Beck, you were there that night when Glenn Beck gave me that Bonhoeffer Angel Award yeah. and Congress recognized us. And uh, the only thing I really take credit for was the fact that we all felt God had put a burden on our heart and we were obedient to that burden that God put on our heart. And beyond that decision, I believe what I witnessed was an absolute divine miracle because I'm not smart enough to, to do the things we did. I think in uh, 2 Corinthians 11, 11 30 says, uh, if you boast, boast in your weakness. And I, I'll tell you right now, I'm not capable of pulling off what we pulled off. I'm not smart enough. I don't have enough experience. Not one of our team members did because what happened in those next three days was just a miracle. We, we seen uh, Sarah Verardo get permission from the Joint Chiefs to allow us as civilians to go into DOD-controlled HKIA airport to do civilian evacuations. Anyone that knows the military knows that's completely impossible door to open. It's not a thing. Not a thing. Yeah. We were allowed to do that. And then we said, okay, now we're going we, to we're gonna get people with SIV papers, P1, P2 visas. We're going to uh, vulnerable women and children. We're going to move them to another country. I can't move them to the United States because I'm not the State Department, but I can move them out of the country. But without visas, I have to have a place to move them to. Otherwise, that's human trafficking. The only place you can do that is in Laredo, Texas. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, <there's> so, okay. <laughs> so, but in the real world, you have, to, uh, you have to have permission. So we called the UAE. We knew some members of the royal family there, and we told them what we wanted to do. And they said you could use our humanitarian center. They rolled out the red carpet, doctors, care, food, facilities. And uh, in addition to that, they said we'll give you a C-17 plane with pilots. And if you fill it up, we'll give you another one. And then we got a call from our friend Glenn Beck, uh, who, you know, the Blaze uh, audience listening here, you guys are amazing. Glenn went on that radio and asked for support. I think he expected to raise thousands. He raised millions. Mm -hmm. And uh, in addition to that, Mercury One as his charity uh, said that they called, when Glenn called me, he said, we raised all this money, but we don't have a ground effort. Uh, and this is three days, all this is happening. And God's just orchestrating these pieces together. And I said, I know exactly what you can do with that money. Uh, we, need we need planes. And Rudy Atala came in and helped us to start chartering planes. And we just synergized this effort. And ultimately in that week, you know, between our ground teams, our team in Abu Dhabi, no one stopped. If anyone stopped for five minutes, they felt like someone was going to die because it was that fast of a pace. I mean, my buddy Seaspray lost 37 pounds in 10 days getting people. We got Aziz. We got his wife and kids. And, and, and the whole 10 days just went by in a blur and, uh, and it ended with the Abbey Gate blowing up, 13 of our service members dying mm -hmm. and, and, uh, and the military welded those gates shut. And then we were forced with a decision as the military was leaving to say, the military is leaving, they don't want to, but they're being forced to, but we, we don't have to, uh, we're not obligated to leave. And uh, I think we, we made an important decision there to say, uh, the White House and the media is saying there's 100 Americans there I'm not saying this is a debate or argument. I'm telling you, there's a thou there were thousands of Americans still there. Mm -hmm. And uh, and we can't leave. And the truth is, it didn't matter if there was 100 or, or, or 1,000. If there's one American left behind, the United States has responsibility. It's a promise to an American civilian that we will go get you. I mean, that's where I come from in the special operations community. Like, we'll scorch the earth around you to go get you if you're in harm's way. And uh, so it didn't matter if it was 100 or 1. It was, it was wrong to leave our civilians behind. It was wrong to do a, to move our military out and shut down our base before our civilians and our allies were out of there mm -hmm. and our equipment was out of there. But they created a scenario. We chose to stay. We did a collaborative effort for another two months in a place called the Mazda Sharif. A lot of organizations were involved. So not, uh, we got a lot of credit for it because of the publicity of it, but there was a lot of amazing organizations, other nonprofits, and Mercury One was one of them, Mighty Oaks Foundation, Save Our Allies, Task Force, Argo, Pineapple Express, all these organizations doing amazing work, and we got another 5,000 people out, bringing us up to about 17,000. It's incredible. But still, that's when we ended up going to Tajikistan because there's still there was so many people left. Was there, were you surprised watch, you know, watching this all come together? Because I was watching, um, you know, like Dunkirk, right? Mm -hmm. And you see this happen where, like, you know, this is, you know, citizens, experts, people, you know, people are here, you know, you're in Des Moines and you're, you're listening to Glenn Beck on the radio and you have a hand in helping rescue these people. People from all over the country were able to chip in. Were you, as you're doing this, and you're obviously at the center of it, but as you're doing this, are you amazed at all these pieces aligning yeah. to make all this possible? Absolutely. It, one, one, I was amazed by it. Uh, 
And, and two, uh, I w- it gave me so much hope mm. uh, because I had, I, I, me and probably you know, everyone else in America, whichever side you're on, has been so frustrated and, and the division and uh, just, the, just the ugliness yeah. that we have in a, in a country that's supposed to be the United States of America. And it's a country that I love so much. And it, it, it had been really down. And in uh, this moment was a moment that the government did not do the right thing. And everybody on all sides believed that the government were not, was not doing the right thing. Yeah. And, and, uh, and when the governments of the world failed, good people stepped up and did the right thing from all different backgrounds. I had people that follow me on social media, just like I'm sure you do, that don't like me. They follow me to tell me ugly <laughs> things. And, yeah. and I had people writing me saying, hey, I don't like you. Like one, I remember specifically one person said, I don't like you, what you stand for, but what you're doing is great. Where can I donate? Wow. And, and wanting to give money to it. Uh, and, and this one Jewish organization uh, was one to help pay for planes, and they had, they were paying for two planes. It was one was eight hundred thousand, one was seven hundred thousand. It was one point five million dollar donation. And Mighty Oaks, my foundation, is a Christian organization. And so they called the guy called me, and he said, "Hey, we couldn't make the donation." And I'm like, "Did I give you the routing number wrong?" Yeah. What ha- he said, "No, you're a Christian organization. We're a Jewish organization." And uh, and I responded, I was like. Okay, but you do realize we're helping Muslims, right? And uh, we just laughed, and he made the donation, and <laughs> and it was just, it was just a beautiful moment seeing yeah. people from different political beliefs and different ideologies and religions and parts of the world just come together, just to do the right thing because people were in need, and uh, and they needed people to help them when they couldn't help themselves, and it was, and 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 not a government in the world, not one government in the world. Uh, did the right thing in that scenario, mm. uh, but uh, people people did. Uh, Wind up selfishly putting yourself in in into these stories, you know. And I think to yeah. myself, is there any part of this that I could have done? And there is a moment where you're swimming from Tajikistan into Afghanistan, mm-hmm. and I realize I can't even do the swim, <laughs> let alone all the stuff you had to do once you got there. Can you tell a little, talk a little bit about the story? Well, first of all, the Panjshir River is as ice melt. Uh, so it's like a slushy. Oh. Uh, if, it, if the water stops, it freezes. So it's it's cold, and then it got Category Five rapids throughout it. So we had to find. Oh my God. But you know, for ten days, myself and Staff Sergeant Dennis Price, uh, we went and traveled about twelve hours through the mountains of Tajikistan, got to the border, and uh, and we um, did about ninety miles of border reconnaissance to do uh, to really assess the routes that people could come across because they had thousands of people stuck in the Panjshir Valley. They wanted to cross, mm. but those mountains are 25,000 foot peaks. Yeah. The Taliban infested them that area to stop the crossings. The Chinese military was there uh, protecting that border keep, to keep people in Afghanistan. The Russian military was there. Mm. Uh, the Tajikistan border guard was there. So at, there were times where we were like 30 yards from the Taliban uh, and, and we, at night, we do all the route recon in the daytime. At night, we do the fording reps, which is swimming across the river in Afghanistan and building the routes and, and plans out to pass that information to our government intelligence agencies that wanted that information. Um, and then uh, other NGOs that were doing evacuations and the commandos on the ground that were trying to get families and, and, and uh, civilians out. And so we provided all that information and it was uh, it was, it was a, it was a pretty crazy week, uh, yeah. <laughs> and, and, but going, going there, that's the one my wife was super uncomfortable with, but it just felt like we still had something left to do. Uh, I really, again, I believe that God was just really burdening my heart still to do that, and it was, it was one of those things that you can't just go there and, and do that if you want to. Even if you want to, there's a lot of doors that have to open to allow you to be in a place like that, mm-hmm. and just every door felt like right. Every door opened for us. It just didn't feel like we were forcing anything to happen, and uh, you know, and you know, it was it was a success, and, a, and I don't know how many people were able to use those routes to get out, but I, I know, you know, what we did in that river was able to, you know, save the lives of, of, of people that needed help. Yeah, I mean, and, you're talking about people who really helped our, you know, our soldiers. Yeah. Uh, these are people f- you know, from Afghanistan who really helped people who are Americans just, you know, yeah. s- there. I, I did not have high expectations for the Biden presidency, to be yeah. clear. Mm-hmm. I did not think it was going to go well. He exceeded all of my expectations with the Afghanistan debacle. I mean, I, I just didn't think even a Democrat would allow something like that to happen, even mm-hmm. someone who was not aligned with me on policy. Sure. I mean, it was it was a catastrophe. It's the worst thing I've ever seen our government do when it comes, you know, related to the military, at least that I can know in my, in my lifetime. Yeah. Um, and, and watching it happen, it seems also unnecessary. Why... Why was there this idea that we had to get every asset, every person out of Afghanistan on these days, in this time frame? I know Donald Trump was the one who kind of set the time frame initially. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, I, Biden certainly made it much, much worse. But 
still, like, there was, there was a, a confluence of belief in the United yeah. States that we need to get out of here. Run. Run yeah. as fast as you can. We need to get out of here. We've been there too long. The war's been going on too long. And I kept coming back to the fact that that's not how you define success. You don't define success by how long you've been there. Is there something in America's interest there still for mm -hmm. us? I think the answer there was clearly yes. Yeah, yeah, and you're absolutely right. And I think it's important to bring up because the reason we ended up in this position in the first place is because I believe the, the American people have been lied to uh, by mm. the mainstream media to say this pressure that we're in this long-term war, America's sons and daughters are dying, we have to get out of it. Uh, President Trump uh, started uh, talking to the Taliban, which I did not agree with. Uh, yeah. I don't think President Trump would have left uh, Bagram Air Force Base, would have withdrew off Bagram Air Force Base, but he was negotiating with the Taliban. I didn't agree with that, and I didn't understand why he or President Biden would talk to the, the Taliban about this. Uh, when President Biden made the decision to do the withdrawal, which he started doing two days after he was in office, he was hastily wanting to do this. His Joint Chiefs, uh, all the Intel Committee, was advising him not to do it hasty, mm -hmm. uh, to not withdraw in the way he did, but he did it anyway. And, uh, and, and he started negotiating again with the Taliban. The Taliban was our enemy for the last 20 years. No one consulted with the Afghan government that we put in place for the last 20 years. No one consulted with our international allies that were at Bagram Air Base. The, why? And what? no one's asked that question even. Chad, why on earth would they do this? Like, we've we put so many resources into this area. Yeah. We, it's an incredibly important area ge geographically. Yeah. You know, you... you they're keeping a sensible pre presence, even mm. just on this base, mm. right. would, would send a message to that region, hey, don't get out of control. If something does get out of control, we can we can step in when, when needed. Mm -hmm. And instead of that, we just abandon all of it. We leave the equipment. We leave our people yeah. behind. I mean, this is insane. Well, Bagram Air Force Base, you're right, is, it's the most strategic place in today's globe. It sits between Iraq, Iran, Russia, and China. Uh, and so to give that base up strategically... One, it was it was not necessary, and two, it's not consistent with our history as being successful militarily around the world. Uh, mm. When I say it wasn't necessary, um, we had 2,500 to 4,000 troops there at a time since 2018. The, this lie of that we've been it's in this long-term war, that ended in 2018 when we went shifted from uh, conventional kinetic combat with the Taliban to a support and advisory role with the Afghan National Army and the Afghan National Police. And we were not doing that alone. The entire international community was rotating on Bagram Air Force Base. We were participating together, and we had this international effort to help the Afghan National Army fight the Taliban and to keep them in the mountains of Afghanistan and away from America and the world in the West. And it was working. It was working perfectly fine. Mm -hmm. So there was no reason to do this in the first place besides political pressure or, uh, or uh, just to show that the administration did something. Uh, and so uh, by doing that, um, and I say it's inconsistent with our strategy, our historical uh, successful strategy in the world, you look at places like uh, Japan, where we have 80,000 troops still since World War II. It worked there. Germany, 40,000 troops since World War II. South Korea, we have 35,000 troops in South Korea since the Korean War. We, we have a history of being able to do this, and it works and keeps stability in the world. Uh, by leaving uh, Afghanistan, we created a vacuum that now our world's enemies get to go there. China, Russia, Iran, Pakistan, intelligence there. And not only that, but we left in a very uh, hasty way. We moved our military out, closed Bagram Air Force Base, before we had uh, our civilians out and our $85 billion in military equipment. Mm. And we didn't even have the extraction plan in place when we moved. We gave a date without terms. And uh, whenever you're doing negotiations, you never give a date without terms. The, I, again, I don't agree with the withdrawal. I believe we should have kept that contingent military force there and participated with the international community to keep terrorism there. Uh, but if we are going to leave, you don't just say a date. You right. say, we will leave when we get our American citizens out, when we get our allies and interpreters out, when we get out our equipment. Anything we want out first, that's when we'll leave. And then the administration goes back and tries to negotiate for more time, and the Taliban says no, and they totally concede to it. Uh, the Taliban was in control of this whole thing. It's embarrassing. And it was embarrassing. I mean, when we left $85 billion in equipment and technology and classified equipment at that. If, if an average U.S. military soldier... Uh, loses a pair of night vision goggles, they're going to jail. Uh, mm. And we're talking $85 billion, and there's no accountability. Well, I'm happy to hear today that there's going to be uh, investigations opening up. Yeah, um, are you encouraged Congress. by are you? Do you think they'll get something out of that? I mean, even yeah. though it might be at some level a partisan exercise, yeah. I'm okay with it. We have to have yeah. answers on this. Yeah. I don't know that accountability will ever, anyone will ever be held accountable for it, but I do want uh, at least through the investigations 
the American people will know more about the truth. I mean, that's the reason I wrote the book. Yeah. Uh, I want people to know what happened uh, there. So um, what do you make of the argument from, you know, and we have about, about a minute left, but, yeah. you know, because conservatives have gone back and forth on some of this stuff. I think everyone got kind of sick of, like, we feels like we're always at war. We've been over there forever. Mm -hmm. What are we even doing over there? Mm -hmm. And Trump, you know, has always been that way. He was sure. against the Iraq war very early. He was, you know, he was never, he never uh, I wouldn't classify him as a military hawk. Mm -hmm. So he was, he, you know, he kind of had a position where it was consistent with his view. Mm -hmm. And I think a lot of Republicans, because he was, you know, the, the standard bearer of the party, mm -hmm. went along with, uh, with, with his view on that, adopted a lot of the stuff that was coming, I think, from the media and the left uh, on, on that particular war. And there were arguments to be made there. I mean, like, you know, maybe our approach needed to be different. Maybe yeah. it was a small force, whatever. But like a lot of people I talk to now on the conservative side say, hey, um, we needed to get out of there. I know it went badly, but we had to get out. I mean, it's, it, it, we got to stop all of our engagement in all these different wars. How do you, how do you answer that critique? Well, first of all, I'm, I'm not pro-war. I have 84 years of war in my family. Uh, World War II, Korea, my mm -hmm. father, you know, we pretty much lost my father in Vietnam, even though he came home. Yeah. Uh, he died because of Vietnam. Uh, I did eight deployments to Afghanistan, buried 15 friends. My son went to Afghanistan. I am not pro-war at all. Mm -hmm. However, uh, when America is strong and America has a strong presence in the world, the world is a safer place, including America. And so we could either choose to have contingents around the world to keep the fight there, or we could choose to let it come here or be in major wars. Having a small presence in Afghanistan of 2,500 troops and participating with the international community to do support and advisory roles and have small contingents of special operations, which, by the way, are all over the world anyway. Mm -hmm. uh, Afghan Iraq, uh, I mean, uh, Iraq right now, Syria, uh, South America, uh, Africa. Uh, doing that prevents us from being in major wars. So I think people who say that need to really look at what they're saying and understand the dynamics of military strategy and security in the world. I mean, we have to have... Uh, uh, a prolonged presence in places like that are hotbeds like this. Once we establish them, you can't just give them up because they are they going to create a, 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 an environment that provokes even a stronger war. I mean, look, our, our, us leaving our military presence in Ukraine allowed a vacuum for Russia to come across that border, and now we're at a war. People could say we're not in war with Russia. We're in a proxy war at Russia right now that could at any moment blow up into a real uh. Uh, war with Russia because President Biden moved U.S. troops out of out of Ukraine. Uh, our presence in the world and our strength in the world prevents us from being at war. Mm -hmm. And I think when people say these things, they, they're really saying it uh, more from a position of uh, principle and not really thinking about it from a strategic point and it, what it actually prevents. Yeah. Uh, leaving Afghanistan created a catastrophe. Weeks later, Al, Al Zahari's running around Afghanistan and Kabul because, uh, because he feels safe to do so. It created a terrorism hotbed, terrorist hotbed, and now our enemies, uh, Iran, China, uh, they're they're known to be on Bagram Air Force Base. We've given up that location to our enemies. Mm, it's really important stuff. An incredible yeah. story. Uh, Chad Rubichaud, he is, of course, the founder and CEO of the Mighty Oaks Foundation, USMC, Force Recon veteran, and author of the new book, Saving Aziz, How the Mission to Help One Became a calling to rescue thousands from the Taliban. And is it true? Like, are we going to see a movie of this thing, too? Does it yes. Look like? uh, amazing uh, 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 film producers, Darren Mormon in Hollywood. Uh, he's uh, fully funded already, so we're not wow. even seeking funding anymore. Uh, and it's going to be made into a motion picture film. And uh, it's very important to me that the world knows what happened mm -hmm. and uh, the truth. Although the movie is going to really be focused on mine and Aziz's you know, relationship back from 2003. And uh, but it's going to cover the evacuation as well. Oh, I can't wait. I mean, yeah. It's going to be fantastic. Yeah. <laughs> Make sure to check it out. Make sure to pick up the book. It's out this week. It's a story that you need to know. And uh, Chad did so much important work when it comes to the efforts that you probably were involved in mm -hmm. uh, as you sent in your donations. So much of this, all, so many things came together to make this incredible story possible. Chad, thanks so much for telling the story and coming on the program. Absolutely, Sue. Thank you.